Wolfhart Pannenberg. Uh, you see his name, and uh, uh, of course he's contemporary, still living, uh, born in 1928. Uh, so in the modern, see, we're talking about modern theology from the last half of the 20th century into the 21st, and uh, I think this is pretty well covered by talking about uh, Jürgen Moltmann, the theology of liberation, and Wolfhard Pannenberg. Uh, once you know these three basic, uh, basic uh, movements, uh, you'll have a pretty good grasp of what's uh, uh, been going on most recently. Uh, <clears throat> Pannenberg is probably the most important individual thinker today in Protestant systematic theology. As I indicated earlier, uh, contemporary theology tends to be done in schools or movements rather than by great individual thinkers, as was the case through the Boltmann era, although uh, Moltmann may be an exception to that. In some ways, Pannenberg exemplifies this tendency. Uh, we also saw a school of thought uh, in liberation theology, too. I was mainly uh, expounding Gutierrez in the lecture, but, uh, uh, you know, I, I listed about 10 or 11 names uh, of people who were doing theology in the mode of liberation theology. So uh, in Pannenberg, we have a little bit of both. We have... Uh, uh, a school of thought, which uh, he began with, and then he has gradually developed over the years to uh, be more famous as an individual uh, thinker. So you see the Pannenberg School there under uh, A1, uh, uh, Rentorf, uh, Koch, Wilkins, uh, Rossler, and so on. Um, but today he's known primarily as an individual thinker. Uh, bottom of 170, he's been under the influence of a number of uh, uh, theologians, studied with both Barth and uh, Karl Jaspers, the secular existentialist at Basel around 1950. His theology today can be understood in many respects as a reaction against Barth, though not in every respect. He also... Um, study the historical disciplines at the University of Heidelberg beginning in 1951 and that's where the uh, Pannenberg circle began to meet. That uh, was encouraged by uh, Hans von Kampenhausen, Gerhard von Rod, and Gunther Bornkamm. Now Pannenberg's distinctive teachings reflect unmistakably the influence of Hegel, uh, so much so that the major differences between Pannenberg and his predecessors may be understood in terms of a shift from Kantian categories to Hegelian ones. Uh, this is not a radical change because uh, both Kant and Hegel operate within the non-Christian transcendence immanence dialectic. Rhetorically, however, the difference is substantial. But remember, uh, we're uh, moving perhaps toward a more Hegelian period. I think Kant is very, I'm sorry, I think that Barth uh, is very Kantian. I think the uh, Geschichte History distinction in Barth, very similar to uh, uh, Kant's uh, noumenal phenomenal distinction. But uh, when you get to, uh, uh, and I think in, in Boltmann the same, uh, but with Tillich, you begin to get more Hegelianism coming in. Uh, uh, Tillich uh, uh, offers a number of dialectics where he uh, says, uh, if you start here, you'll move over to the, this opposite extreme, but uh, uh, then you can get away from both extremes by going to the depth of the question, and uh, uh, so you get the third member of the triad. And, uh, a lot of Tillich's theology operates... Uh, in terms of triads like that. Uh, and I think that, uh, of course, uh, with uh, Moltmann, uh, you, you have a somewhat more uh, Hegelian movement, although uh, uh, the, the idea of the open future is really not very Hegelian, in my opinion. 
But the idea that uh, God is somehow uh, coming to know himself in the future, that's a Hegelian idea. Theology of liberation gets back to Hegel by way of Marx. And uh, now Ponenberg, I think, is a little bit more of a pure Hegelian, as we'll see in, in uh, my subsequent description of him. Uh, the, uh, for example, the Hegelian approach to the existence of God in his book, The Apostles' Creed. Much of the lecture material that I'm giving you will be uh, uh, based on uh, Ponenberg's book on the Apostles' Creed. That, that's an early book, like uh, Moltmann's uh, Theology of Hope. But uh, again, I think that the earlier book uh, is somewhat more concise and gives us a little bit easier way of uh, getting a handle on him. Ponenberg has since written uh, Systematic Theology, so there's, if you want to write a, a dissertation, there's plenty of material in Ponenberg for any number of dissertations, but I'm going to stick with the very basics as I do for most of the thinkers in this course. Uh, Ponenberg, like Hegel, seeks to rehabilitate rationalism um, after a period of uh, irrationalism. You remember Kant, uh, uh, disbelieved in the noumenal world. He, he thought that we couldn't know what was in the noumenal world. Uh, Hegel rejected the noumenal world, and Hegel rejected the uh, distinction between uh, uh, noumenal and phenomenal. Uh, similarly, Ponenberg uh, uh, is coming along after a series of rather Kantian uh, philosophies uh, or theologies like uh, that of Barth. And he's moving toward a more uh, rationalistic type of approach, and we can see his Hegelianism there. Um, also, uh, Ponenberg sees the truth as a rational historical process in which contradictions are resolved in higher syntheses. He also uh, uh, is very comfortable with the Hegelian uh, slogan that the truth is in the whole. That we don't know anything for sure until we get to the final end. Uh, Moltmann was kind of, uh, kind of agreed with that too. And therefore, if we're going to know anything in the present, uh, the final end must be present too, in a kind of way, uh, the already and the not yet. So uh, we, we ought to, uh, we'll get to thinking about that a little bit. Uh, at the bottom of 171, there's some uh, material on the uh, way evangelicals uh, received Ponenberg's work. Uh, Ponenberg first uh, became known to evangelicals in the 1950s and 60s when uh, uh, he was presented in Christianity Today, for example, as somebody who believed in the uh, uh, historical resurrection of Christ. Now, uh, that was amazing to have that coming from Germany. <laughs> we all uh, suppose that uh, anything uh, uh, that uh, nobody in Germany believed in the resurrection anymore, uh, nobody in Germany believed in miraculous events. And uh, so we, our, our ears pricked up. Uh, we were kind of interested in finding out who this wonderful, remarkable, brilliant German was. Uh, who was defending the historical resurrection and even doing it in terms that were kind of familiar to us. We were very uh, familiar with uh, uh, the evidential apologetics of John War Warwick Montgomery and people like that, uh, later on William Lane Craig, uh, but the uh, idea of accumulating various evidences for the resurrection and then using that as the foundation stone of apologetics. Uh, that was uh, very, very much a part of our culture. And uh, Ponenberg came along saying some things that were very similar uh, to that apologetic, that traditional apologetic for the resurrection of Christ. So uh, Ponenberg s sort of looked evangelical, and, and he uh, sometimes uh, encouraged that. This, I think, is the, co uh, is the conservative drift back with us again uh, after the uh, radical unbelief of Boltmann and Tillich and Christian atheism and secular theology. 
Uh, now we're back to something a little bit more familiar. Uh, we're back to something that sounds more biblical, sounds more traditional. I think that Moltmann is somewhat uh, more of the traditional line. Uh, liberation theology, for all its emphasis on Marxism, always tries to find a biblical basis for everything that they say. And uh, Pannenberg even more so. But I, I think that uh, with, with Pannenberg and, and with these others as well, uh, what we have is not a genuine conservatism. It's not a genuine adherence to a, a distinctively biblical uh, worldview, a biblical history. Uh, I think what we have is a distinctively modern kind of theology, but uh, it's uh, uh, put in a very biblical kind of garb. Well, uh, let's look at uh, this next page. Under B, the relationship between faith and reason. Here we are. Faith uh, for Pannenberg is commitment. And again, I'm kind of expounding his little book on the Apostles' Creed. Uh, the validity of a faith commitment depends upon the reliability of its object, its truth. Well, this, is, this is very uh, attractive to, to evangelicals. Uh, this is what we say all the time. Uh, that the validity of faith depends on its object. What are we uh, believing in? Trust, he says, is not theoretical cognizance, but it does involve believing certain things to be true. Now, that's refreshing. Uh, after all the theologians who have told us uh, that faith is non-propositional and faith doesn't tell us any truths but just kind of puts us in touch with God or gives us a mystical relationship to God or gives us some kind of a, uh, an experience, uh, Pannenberg is coming back to uh, uh, what is more uh, commonly said among traditional Orthodox Christians, that uh, uh, faith does involve assent, uh, assent to certain truths. Uh, it's not to be identified with assent. There's more to it than that. There's certainly the element of trust, for example, uh, commitment, as Pannenberg says, uh, but uh, there is this element of uh, a propositional truth. So faith depends on the support of historical, natural facts. Uh, on the basis of these, it commits itself to the rea reality and truth of the invisible God. And of course, it rests on the truth of God's promises. There's the correlation with Moltmann, things hoped for in the future. So we're off to a good start here. Uh, uh, Pannenberg is willing to say faith is based on facts. Uh, faith is based on history. Uh, even faith is based on uh, rational apprehension of those facts, and that's, that's all pretty important. Then uh, number three, uh, all knowledge, including the knowledge of faith, is incomplete and provisional. Why? Because first, uh, God is an invisible reality. Now, statements in the creed are, he says, subject to considerable doubt. Our experience of the world is constantly changing. What was certain yesterday is not necessarily certain today. Final answers, he says, will not be known until the consummation of history. Only the future will show the essence of things. Remember that? Uh, we've seen that uh, earlier in a number of the theologians we've talked about in uh, existential philosophy. Only the future will show the essence of things. There are no absolute laws in nature because there are no absolute similarities. Uh, everything is different from everything else. So our understanding of Christ, like our response to him, will always be capable of improvement. The Spirit uh, is here to help us, to be sure, but the Spirit doesn't give us theoretical certainty about things. Uh, no form of life is final. Faith in God entails a realization of the provisional character of the world and of all finite reality. 
This is the only reason for the continued existence of the church as an institution separate from the world. Now, you, you see what he's saying is that uh, there's nothing absolutely certain in this world. Here we might get a little suspicious of Pondenberg because we do believe that there are certainties, but uh, uh, there are certainties uh, in Scripture, but uh, uh, those certainties, uh, there's an awful lot that we're not certain about, and uh, those certainties, of course, have to be approached in a legitimately uh, biblical way. So let's give Paul and Berg the benefit of the doubt here and uh, move on to what he says about how to uh, uh, gain knowledge of these important facts. Uh, number four, the claims of faith must be subject to rational verification. Okay, this is, this is new. This is something that Bart would not have said. This is something that Boltmann would not have said. Uh, not, this is something that Tillich would not have said, although maybe he believed it. Uh, the tendency before Ponenberg is to say that uh, the claims of faith, that faith is completely different from the area of rational verification. Rational verification is in the theoretical sphere. Uh, faith is in the, the practical sphere or the religious sphere or some other sphere, but not the sphere of reason. Uh, Bart and other theologians uh, tried very hard to separate the sphere of faith from the sphere of reason. That's really uh, uh, Lessing's big ditch. Uh, Pottenberg, in one way, is trying to get beyond Lessing here, and we'll see what he, he, what he does. I don't think he actually manages to get beyond Lessing's ditch, but we'll see if he is able to do this. Uh, he says uh, the claims of faith must be subject to rational verification. Otherwise, we leave the truth of these claims undecided. We leave the truth of these claims undecided. See, the, for him, finding the truth of something is always finding it rationally. That's what reason is. Reason is our faculty for discovering truth. And if uh, our reason doesn't agree to something, then it can't be true. Now, maybe you don't want to hear that. I mean, maybe that's contrary to the way you think about uh, revelation and so on. And, uh, of course, in the Reformed faith, we say that uh, revelation is, is more important than reason, and revelation transcends reason, and re revelation is the basis for reason, and that uh, understanding comes after faith, and so on and so forth. But, but think about this. I mean, we, we have always insisted that our faith does not contradict reason. Uh, we, we, we've always insisted that, uh, uh, that what we believe is true. And if it's true, then it's acceptable to reason. Now, we have to use the right presuppositions when we go about reasoning and uh, so on. But uh, there is that... Uh, uh, but we do want to insist that faith is not in some ghostly sphere uh, up above history, uh, up above reason, uh, but it's uh, in, in a sphere where we can become convinced that our faith is really true and therefore really uh, in line with, with reason. Well, the truth of our faith claims is not established merely by our decision to believe them. That is blind faith, says Pondenberg. That is self-redemption. We can test assertions about uh, matters of faith, the resurrection, he says, solely and exclusively by the methods of historical research. There is no other way of testing assertions about happenings that are said to have taken place in the past. Okay, here he seems to be directly contradicting uh, 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 Lessing, or maybe he's not. Maybe he's saying, okay, uh, maybe you disagree with Lessing that uh, history is is not so, excuse me, that, that, that history is uh, capable of being known, uh, that it doesn't escape our, our, our knowledge. Well, if that's so, then the only way you can show it is through historical research. Now, uh, Lessing said you can't get faith out of history. Pondenberg says, well, if you're going to have faith at all, it's got to come through history. We really have no choice about this. 
Uh, Ritchell felt something of that argument. Uh, Ritchell wanted to go back to history, but only to get the value judgments out of history. Pannenberg says, no, if you want your faith to be based on history, there's no other way to do it than through historical research. Now, I agree with that. My only, uh, uh, my only qualification is that it's got to be through Christian historical research based on Christian presuppositions. But let's see what Pannenberg has to say about that. Um, so we need, he says we need to use the methods of historical research. Not every Christian needs to be a historian, but we need to know that the, uh, that kind of knowledge is, exists somewhere uh, in the church. We can, uh, to be sure, subscribe to the creeds, even when we are critical of them, as long as we know the intentions of the authors. But people who try to make Christianity independent of historical, should bring this down for you. People who try to make Christianity independent of historical research are trying to escape the vulnerability of Christianity, that is, its susceptibility to falsification. But that vulnerability is central to the very nature of the gospel. Historical facts, therefore, and therefore historical research are indispensable in Christianity. So Pannenberg says what a lot of evangelicals say, and what I certainly would agree with, that uh, uh, Christianity is based on historical facts. Uh, and uh, therefore, uh, they have to be ascertained by historical study. Now, what kind of historical study is uh, another question, but... Uh, uh, we can't uh, defend Christianity by lifting it up above history because uh, that would turn Christianity into something other than what it is. Now, number five, uh, presuppositions and verification. On, on my view, what I would say was, Pannenberg, you're right. We need to uh, get the truth out of historical research, but it has to be research based on Christian presuppositions. Now let's see what Pannenberg says. Pannenberg says, in every historical judgment, the evaluator's whole experience of the world and himself plays a part. What this or that historian believes to be in any way possible depends on his own picture of reality. The historian is not justified, however, in assuming that nature is absolutely uniform. Uh, science itself denies that. Now here he's taking a swipe at Boltmann, all right? Uh, Boltmann said that uh, science has discovered that uh, the world is a closed system of cause and effect and that therefore there can be no miracles and uh, every uh, event uh, comes, happens in accord with the scientific laws that have been formulated. Pannenberg says you, you don't know that. You can't be sure about that. Uh, you can't be sure that nature is absolutely uniform. You can't be sure that the laws that uh, govern events today will be exactly the same as those that govern events tomorrow. So we must keep an open mind as historians when we're faced with possible events that are not fully explicable according to normal rules. Now, uh, what about revelation? Uh, is God able to come into history and give us revelation to tell us what the meaning of things is? Uh, here, uh, and I'm, I'm basing this on some things that are not directly in the Apostles' Creed book, Pannenberg disagrees with the neo-Orthodox contention that revelation in Scripture is never propositional. He recognizes that Scripture often represents God as conveying information to and through prophets. Um, he himself denies, however, that revelation has that kind of directness. He thinks that Scripture teaches propositional revelation, but he doesn't believe that propositional revelation has occurred. For Pannenberg, uh, revelation is indirectly given to us. We discern revelation only through events, not through divinely given sentences. Uh, direct revelation, he says, occurs only at the end. See, again, the future orientation. The event of Christ, his incarnation, resurrection, and ascension, is the criterion for our thinking about God, for in Christ uh, 
the end of history is disclosed. Scripture teaches us of Christ, but we must study Scripture critically uh, if we're going to uh, use it rightly. Okay, a little bit now about uh, his uh, various doctrinal subjects, what he says about various doctrinal subjects. First, the doctrine of God. Only the presence of God in Jesus gives his message universal significance. Uh, people are sort of inclined to say uh, in the modern period, don't worry about God, just look at Jesus. Okay? Um, that, that's kind of tempting, isn't it? I mean, we sort of wish we could, we could say, well, don't, if you've got problems about God and his sovereignty and our responsibility and, and where evil came from and all of that, don't worry about God, just look at Jesus. I suppose there are times when that has to be said. I mean, we need to tell people, uh, uh, look, at, look at Jesus, the question of your life is what will you do with Jesus? And Jesus is the revelation of God. So uh, uh, cast your eyes upon Jesus. Look at uh, uh, who he is and uh, uh, start your thinking about God from that point. I, I think that's sometimes good advice to make. But Pannenberg says, and this is a good point too, Pannenberg says that uh, uh, why should we pay any attention to Jesus unless indeed he has a special revel or re relationship with God? It's only the presence of God in Jesus that gives his message universal significance. The ethic of forgiving love, uh, which Jesus taught, is too demanding for us unless God stands behind it. Uh, see, if Jesus is just a man and he says, oh, forgive everybody and, uh, uh, you know, let them slap you on the other cheek and uh, uh, do not return evil for evil, well, that, that's fine for him, but, uh, but uh, you know, that's just a human opinion, and uh, uh, people tend to get slapped around when they behave that way. Uh, but if God stands behind it, if, God, if this is the very nature of God's justice, if this is what God's judgment is going to take into account, then that uh, puts Jesus' ethic on a whole different level. Uh, what about the existence of God? Is there a God? Well, Tillich uh, thought it was sort of suspicious. Uh, we shouldn't. We, we we should be kind of hesitant to speak of the existence of God because uh, existence would mean that uh, uh, God is uh, distinct from his essence or something. Uh, and of course, there are the Christian atheists and everybody who uh, think that uh, the existence of God is very problematic. Pannenberg says no. Let's get back to where we were. Uh, the question of God's existence is a serious question. It's unavoidable. And of course, uh, Feuerbach doesn't believe in God. Marx doesn't. Freud doesn't. The death of God theologians don't. Uh, but, uh, you know, we've got to, uh, we've got to uh, recognize that, that God is part of Christianity. Uh, we can't uh, be like Barth and say... Uh, uh, Christianity has no uh, analogy to other religions. Uh, there are gods in, in many different religions, and it's important for us to be able to show that the God of the Bible, the God of Jesus, is the true God. So the, the philosophical dialogue about God's existence is legitimate. Uh, this is assumed from the beginning of the mission to the Gentiles, uh, uh, Christianity adopted the philosophical principle of the unity of God, uh, taken, taken from the Old Testament, and of course exploited it in places like uh, Acts 17, where Paul told the uh, Epicureans and Stoics that there was one God uh, different from the ones that they worshipped. Well, how can we prove that God exists? Uh, Pannenberg uh, says that the old causal arguments are not uh, cogent to modern people anymore because, uh, well, in Thomas Aquinas, you know, Thomas said that uh, we need a first cause because there can't be an infinite regress of causes. Uh, Pannenberg says that uh, in the modern day, uh, uh, infinite regresses are not considered to be absurd. 
uh, self-explanatory in inertia and various things like that are, are considered seriously. Uh, you might look at my paper called Infinite Regress in order to get some of that discussion. Uh, but Pottenberg says, nevertheless, in, in the modern period, it's possible to uh, uh, take seriously the idea of God. Consider your own limits. Uh, consider the fact that we are finite, that we are limited. Well, if we are finite, if we are limited, then there must be something beyond ourselves. There must be something that is unlimited. There must be something that's not finite. It might be empty space, but uh, there's something out there. Uh, now, uh, the, uh, if, if it's unlimited, then of course it bears some of the attributes of God. Uh, Pottenberg goes into this in more detail. Uh, he, he admits that uh, the argument is not a deductively certain conclusion, that each one must decide for himself uh, whether the concept of God illumines reality for him. But if that concept does uh, illumine reality for you, then you can't be like Kant and say it's only a regulative concept. You have to say this is, uh, uh, if this being uh, has any meaning at all, then uh, I, I have to assume that he really exists. Uh, and uh, believe in him. Well, he talks about uh, the various uh, uh, attributes and predicates of God in Scripture. God is power. God is father. God is person. God as future, interestingly, uh, kind of like Moltmann. Uh, since God's power and kingdom are yet to come, therefore, in a way, God is yet to come because God is his power. God is his kingdom. And only in the light of this future is the truth unveiled. Creation and providence can be understood only in the light of that end. Well, the person of Christ. God is known only through Christ. This is something that Bart also said. But uh, Pondenberg says vice versa. Christ is known only through God. You need to have both of them. You need to have a Trinitarian understanding in order to understand any individual person. Historically, he says, Israel's faith in God comes before Jesus. Jesus presupposes it, but through Jesus, this presupposed understanding of God is remodeled, receiving a new and specific definition. So uh, you can't be Christomonists, as uh, uh, Bart is often accused of being, putting uh, Christ alone. Uh, rather, uh, there's a reciprocal knowledge between knowing God and knowing Christ. Pondenberry speaks about the historical Jesus. Uh, and remember, uh, 20th century, well, 19th and 20th century theology have been very ambivalent about the historical Jesus, okay? There was the old quest back with the Richlians, which uh, eventually admitted that they couldn't find anything much about the historical Jesus. Bart uh, expressed a lot of ignorance about the historical Jesus, what he was actually like. And then you've got Bultmann denying nearly everything, and you have the new quest coming along. And uh, so the whole question is, number one, is Jesus historical? And number two, uh, what is the importance of the historical Jesus for faith? And by the way, Paul Tillich uh, more or less uh, uh, dissolves the historical Jesus into a philosophical concept, which he calls the Christ, uh, the uh, um, uh, existence of the Christ. Well, what does Pondenberg say? Pondenberg says that Christianity has a unique vulnerability since its faith in God is related to a historical person. Okay, so Pondenberg's putting a lot of weight on Jesus as a historical person. And uh, he acknowledges with Lessing and Ritchell and others that it's difficult to get information about a historical person. And it's difficult to put uh, theological weight on the existence of a historical person uh, because historians can look at our evidence and they can refute our claims. But we've got to make these claims, you know. We, we can't take a flight from history. We can't say, well, I can't, I can't prove Jesus, and you know, I can't show that Jesus really existed, and can't show that Jesus did the things that uh, 
uh, the Bible claims he did, then therefore uh, I'll develop a kind of Christianity that's not dependent on history. I mean, that's what uh, people did following Lessing. Pannenberg says, that's too simplistic. Uh, don't do that. We need history. It's not really Christianity anymore if we don't base it on uh, the history of Jesus. Uh, history might seek to get uh, beyond, behind even the scriptures to discover the truth about Jesus. Well, what do we know about Jesus? One, his life and message were determined by his expectation of the immediately impending end of the world. Okay? So Jesus is thoroughly apocalyptic, thoroughly eschatological. This is important to, to uh, Schweitzer and Weiss. Although Schweitzer and Weiss said this makes Jesus impossible to follow for modern man. Uh, how can we possibly follow an apocalyptic visionary who thought the world was about to end? Moltmann very cleverly takes this and uh, uh, says, well, I agree that uh, Jesus was uh, an apocalyptic, and therefore, of course, he focused on the future, not on the past, and so we can develop a future-based theology out of this. Uh, Pannenberg says that... Uh, this is a fact about the historical Jesus, that his life and message were determined by his expectation of the immediately impending end of the world. And he says this does cause offense to modern man. How can we base our faith on this? I mean, Lessing couldn't abide this idea. He admits, Pannenberg admits, we cannot construct a biography of Jesus. There's a lot about him, about his life that we don't know. But we do know the basic facts. The baptism by John, uh, he thinks, is uh, historically unassailable. Uh, basic features of Jesus' earthly activity and message, his death on the cross in Jerusalem, his resurrection, or at least the, the, the assertion of the resurrection by the first Christians. What was Jesus' message? Jesus' message was, First, repentance in preparation for the coming judgment. Second, the promise of salvation to anyone who accepts the message and accepts Jesus as the herald of the message. See, the fate of men depends solely on their attitude toward the coming kingdom. Therefore, salvation is not by the law, and this is what brings the conflict between Jesus and the Jews, uh, e, to accept Jesus is to accept the coming kingdom and, and vice versa. Therefore, Jesus is the criterion for all our knowledge of God. Now, uh, is this message incredible for modern men? And this is the great question of the 20th century, of course. Can modern man believe uh, what uh, the Bible teaches? Well, says uh, Pannenberg, we cannot accept Jesus apart from his eschatological expectation. The ethic of love and faith and forgiveness rests on that. The kingdom of God uh, did appear, he says definitively, in the resurrection. And only through the resurrection was it possible for the disciples to believe in Jesus after the cross. Now, here, uh, Pannenberg uh, discusses a number of the titles of Jesus that are used in the New Testament. The title Son of Man, uh, Suffering Servant of God, Messiah, Son of God, Lord. Um, and uh, these I'm not going to go through in detail. Uh, basically what Pannenberg says about all of them is that these are based on the resurrection. Uh, when people call, and remember now, Pannenberg doesn't believe in the inerrancy of Scripture. Uh, he believes there are mistakes in the Bible, but uh, he tends to be more conservative on historical matters than, say, Boltmann was. So uh, here we are in uh, 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 page... Uh, well, you see under uh, uh, number three, Son of Man, Suffering Servant, Messiah, 
um, son of God. Uh, they, they were willing to use those names. They were willing to use those titles of Jesus because of Jesus' resurrection. They didn't necessarily use those titles during his earthly life. They didn't call him Lord when they saw him uh, teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. They didn't necessarily call him the Son of God uh, when he fed the 5,000 or however many he fed. Pon and Bear doesn't know. Uh, but uh, uh, after Jesus was raised from the dead, and remember, Pondenberg qualifies that. Uh, he was raised from the dead, or uh, they thought that he'd been raised from the dead. After that, they started calling him by these titles. And so when they wrote their Gospels and they wrote their accounts of what Jesus did, they called him Lord, they called him Son of Man, they called him by all these exalted names. And so the whole thing depends on the resurrection. If Jesus is raised from the dead, then all those titles are appropriate, including God, if you want. Uh, if, but if he's not raised from the dead, then, of course, those titles are not appropriate, and uh, the whole uh, Christian faith is a work of fiction. Well, let's. Uh, uh, so I want to go over to uh, page 77. Now, uh, the event, for example, section E, the event of Jesus' conception and birth. What about uh, the virgin birth? Well, uh, Pondenberg points out that the virgin birth originally emphasized the humanity of Christ, that the Son of God came into the world by natural birth. But he says there are some problems in the narrative. Uh, but uh, number three is very, very basic and very typical of Pannenberg. He says the story can be explained as a retrospective justification for Jesus' sonship, all right? Uh, so that's what it is. Not didn't really happen necessarily. Uh, but it's the kind of story that people would make up after they were persuaded that Jesus was resurrected from the dead and therefore, after they were persuaded that he was the Son of God and the Lord and the Messiah and uh, all those other things. So the virgin birth is legendary, but uh, it seems to be appropriate because of the other things that are said about Jesus uh, in, the, uh, in the Gospels. Now, all of this kind of focuses on uh, Jesus' sufferings, his death, and his resurrection. And I want to look at that a little bit more closely. Pannenberg asks this, what does it mean to say that Christ died for his people? That he died for me? This seems to indicate that his death was vicarious. He died a death that someone else should have died. Is it possible for modern men as we read through the scriptures, is it possible for us to conclude that Jesus' death was vicarious, that in a sense he was dying for us? Well, um, why did Jesus die? He, he, he died as the result of a legal process. And he was charged, uh, there were two charges against him. Uh, one was the charge of blasphemy, which came from the Jews, and the other was the charge of sedition, or rebelling against the government, which came from the Romans. Um, first, the charge of blasphemy. Jesus knew that his death was possible, though he didn't seek, to pro seek it, uh, nor did he prophesy it. Um, the Gospels say that he did prophesy it, but Pannenberg doesn't believe that, so... Uh, uh, what, what happened was that Jesus went to Jerusalem to force the Jews to make a decision about him. The Jews instead accused Jesus of blasphemy and falsely accused him to the Romans of sedition. The resurrection, show, and we'll talk about that when we get to it, the resurrection shows that these charges were wrong. Further, it exposes the Jews themselves as blasphemers because uh, the Jews... Uh, 
uh, claimed that he had been a blasphemer, while in fact he was really God. He was really right to say that he was the Son of God. And because they disrespected him, then they were the blasphemers instead of him. So Jesus literally died the death that they deserved. In that sense, Jesus' death was vicarious. And since the Jews and Pilate were acting as office bearers, representative of the Jews and Pilate representing the Gentiles, Pilate representing the rest of mankind, Jesus died for all. Jesus died for both Jews and Gentiles. You see, the Jewish leaders should have died, Pilate should have died, but instead Jesus died in their place. And that's a vicarious atonement. Now, uh, you know, you might think, well, no, wait a minute here. I mean, that doesn't sound too persuasive. Uh, but, uh, uh, I mean, usually when we, when we say that Jesus' death was vicarious, we mean he died for me. Uh, I committed sins, and he paid the penalty for my sins, not just Pilate's sins, not just the sins of the Jewish leaders, but, but me. And how does Pannenberg uh, ever generalize his uh, concept of vicarious atonement to cover, cover me? The best I can figure out is that he, he, he just kind of says that uh, the Jews represented all, all the Jews, you know, the Jewish leaders represented all the Jews because they were the officers, and Pilate was the uh, relevant officer uh, among the Gentiles. I'm not sure that this is a very uh, persuasive account of uh, vicarious atonement, but uh, anyway, that's, that's, what, uh, that's what Pannenberg sets before us. Uh, you, you look down at the bottom under sedition here. Was Jesus guilty of sedition? Uh, well, he, uh, Jesus' message of the kingdom did threaten the claims of political rule, though the charge was literally false. But the resurrection shows Paul and Rome, I'm sorry, shows Pilate and Rome themselves to be guilty of sedition against God. So his death was in their place vicarious. I guess what you have to do is you've got to persuade yourself that, that whether you're Gentile or Jew, you've got to persuade yourself that among your sins are the sin of blasphemy that you have put yourself in the place of God or you've worshipped something else in the place of God and sedition that you've been a rebel against God that you've rebelled against his covenant order and if that's persuasive to you then, then I guess uh, Pannenberg's argument is also also persuasive but now let's look uh, uh, under page, uh, on page 178. I'm skipping some things here. It's very important that we look at uh, Pannenberg's view of Jesus' resurrection because he, he makes everything to rest on Jesus' resurrection. All the accounts, all the biblical accounts of salvation in the New Testament presuppose the resurrection. Without the, the resurrection, the story of Jesus is only a story of failure. Now, what is the resurrection? Pannenberg says that the resurrection of Jesus is not simply the coming to life of a corpse. But uh, I, I, guess, I guess what would be the coming to life of a corpse? Uh, Lazarus would be an example of that. You know, Lazarus died and Lazarus... Uh, came back to life. But of course we, we assume that Lazarus died again eventually. Um, so we, we, we can understand what it means for a corpse to be revivified. But that's, uh, in, in scripture there's a lot more than that with regard to Jesus' resurrection. Uh, Pondenberg says not a revivified corpse. I, I would say not merely but um, but Pannenberg says uh, what, what's really important about Jesus was that he was transformed to an entirely new 
plane of life, the appearance in time of the end of history, radical transformation, unity with the creative origin of life, so that there can be no more death, 1 Corinthians 15.35 and following. So, Pallenberg says the resurrection of Christ should not be confused with the miraculous raisings of Lazarus, others, and others who don't fit into this category. He, as a, to show his critical credentials, he says these are less credible, and these, uh, but he also says, and this is true, that these are only temporary, these are only signs of the true resurrection. So, resurrection is a metaphor for something unimaginable. Some background uh, here. Paul, uh, Ponenberg says, uh, Paul was a Pharisee, and as a Pharisee, Paul expected the resurrection. You remember the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. The Pharisees did. And occasionally that conflict uh, comes into play uh, in, in Scripture. I need to give that. Okay. Uh, now, Jesus, of course, did believe in the resurrection, and uh, uh, there was a kind of general belief uh, uh, that uh, there would be a resurrection of uh, the righteous and the wicked uh, toward the end time. Now, the historicity of the resurrection. Ponenberg says, first of all, resurrection is a meaningful concept. There might be somebody around who says uh, his resurrection is not meaningful. Once people die, well, that's the end. I mean, that's the meaning of death, right? Uh, but Ponenberg says, no, resurrection is a meaningful concept. Man recognizes the limitations of life. Uh, every, even modern man does. And that presupposes some knowledge of what lies beyond the limit. This is very similar to Ponenberg's argument for the existence of God that we discussed earlier. Uh, you can discuss the limits of life. How do we talk about what's beyond the limits? Well, as Kant said, uh, it's really difficult, you know, uh, to talk about what's... Uh, unknowable to talk about what goes beyond what we know. Um, but we can, we can form analogies. I mean, the only way we can talk is by analogy with what we know. What we know is life. So when we're talking about life beyond the limit, or when we talk about what is beyond the limit, it occurs to us to say it's a life beyond the limit. It's a life after death. Now, Pollenberg says that the resurrection is a more realistic concept than the Greek notion of immortality, which you find in Plato and people like that. Uh, resurrection takes more seriously the gap between life and death, and resurrection takes more seriously the physico-spiritual unity of man. That is, uh, uh, the Greek Plato believed in the immortality of the soul, but the doctrine of resurrection is the immortality of the soul and the body together. So uh, it's something greater. Now, so it's a meaningful concept. But how do we know that it happened? Well, Ponenberg, and here, here this is something that's quite unique about Ponenberg among modern theologians. He says we have to test this hypothesis by the methods of critical research. One must be skeptical up to a point. I mean, resurrections don't happen all the time. The resurrection of Jesus is a claim to a unique happening, very unusual event. But uh, there can be no scientific objection to the resurrection. Science, he says, doesn't determine what can happen. Science determines what does happen and why, but it doesn't tell us what can happen and what can't happen. Ponenberg is willing to say that natural law always uh, is in play, but he says that unknown factors can relate to natural law in new ways, like Warfield's 
illustration that uh, when an airplane takes off, uh, it's not breaking the law of gravity, but it's injecting a new force into the equation that has to be uh, uh, that modifies uh, other calculations. And the resurrection, if true, comes from a sphere inaccessible otherwise to human experience and therefore can be expressed only metaphorically. Uh, and science doesn't take uh, adequate account of the contingency of events. Now, the state of the question, according to Ponenberg, he says there are legendary elements in the resurrection accounts, but, they can't, but the accounts cannot be shown to be entirely legendary. You can't account for the resurrection by saying that people had hallucinations. Uh, those explanations won't work. Uh, Paul says uh, 500 people at once saw the risen Jesus, so you can't imagine that 500 people at once would have the same hallucination. Uh, you, you can't say that uh, you know, various groups of disciples in different places at different times all had the same hallucination. Hallucinations just don't work that way. Otherwise, says Ponenberg, there's strong evidence, though there's still room for dispute. One may suspend judgment, but if you suspend judgment, you are renouncing the possibility of understanding anything about the origins of Christianity. Because if the resurrection didn't uh, cause the expansion of the church, what did? Uh, it becomes a total mystery unless you say that the uh, uh, church spread, that people believed in, in the gospel because uh, of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. One would, of course, expect the resurrection to be controversial since it cuts so deeply into fundamental questions of the understanding of reality. But now, what is, what is Ponenberg saying here? Is this a return to an orthodox, an evangelical view of Jesus' resurrection as the foundation of Christian faith? And I say no. Here is what Ponenberg says. He says that something very, very unusual happened. He doesn't say that the body of Jesus came out of the grave and started walking around. He said something very unusual happened. And the apostles, because they were Jews, the first witnesses of the resurrection were, were Jews. These were people who believed in the resurrection of the righteous and the wicked on the last day. So what vocabulary would they use to describe this unimaginable unique happening? They chose, and it's no surprise, because they're Jews, they chose to describe it in terms of resurrection. That uh, the end time, it was as if the end time had come. It was as if the final judgment was here. And Jesus was the first one to rise from the dead. That's, we don't know what happened. But that's the vocabulary that they use. See, they made a linguistic choice. They chose to call it the resurrection. And then Ponenberg says, nobody can contradict that. And uh, there, there's really no other viable explanation for the things that took place. But uh, it's very, he's very vague, you see, really. It's not, not at all as specific as what you have in Scripture, as we don't really know what this, what this marvelous event was. It was a numinal something. It was a something that, that uh, defied any human attention to describe. It's kind of like the non-Christian transcendence. It's, a, it's an event that uh, uh, really could not be described uh, appropriately. But uh, we try to do it. And of course, that, that's... We do it on our own authority, basically. We do it on the basis of our autonomous reasoning, and that's what Ponenberg is recommending all through here. He's recommending that we uh, base our uh, 
decisions on uh, autonomous reasoning. So, but, but nevertheless, uh, he believes that uh, uh, all of this entitles us to say that Jesus was raised from the dead, that Jesus' resurrection was historical, and therefore uh, Christianity has a firm basis in history, not in Geschichte, uh, not in Heil's Geschichte, uh, Bultmann, but, but in actual, actual history. Um, but I, I do uh, suggest that you take a look at his book on the Apostles' Creed, and if you're interested, look, uh, take a look at his uh, systematic theology. And uh, he's very, very good in a way. I mean, he, he's a clever fellow. <laughs> uh, that's what Rudolf Bultmann said about Pannenberg. Uh, uh, of course, Pannenberg's statements were the exact opposite of Bultmann's. Bultmann is such a skeptic about the resurrection. You know, Bultmann doesn't believe in the resurrection at all. I mean, just frankly, uh, the people came to him and said, you know, Pannenberg has worked out this argument for the resurrection. And uh, Bultmann read it, and his conclusion was that Pannenberg was clever. And I think that's a pretty good way of describing Pannenberg. Uh, uh, I, I'm not really convinced that uh, his idea of a vicarious atonement is really a vicarious atonement. And I'm not really convinced entirely that his view of Jesus' resurrection really is what the Bible describes as Jesus' resurrection. But it's a very clever way of uh, uh, justifying the use of traditional terminology for something that clearly is not... Uh, Traditional. I mean, his his argument is based on uh, on intellectual autonomy. His argument is based on rationalistic uh, historiography, and uh, that, uh, of course, is uh, uh, just the opposite of of what I've been arguing uh, constitutes a Christian uh, philosophy or Christian worldview.